Good day, everyone. Welcome to one of our bite-sized videos of which the purpose is to bring you, the integrator, up to speed with some of the basic concepts surrounding the Flowgear integration experience, as well as take a brief dive into one of our popular use cases. We're going to start by exploring the screen in front of you, the Flowgear console, which is the very first thing you'll be greeted with after logging into Flowgear. The Flowgear console provides access to all the components relevant to your integrations. From here, you can navigate to spaces that facilitate the setup for different parts of the integration. The three primary spaces that I'd like to briefly touch on are the workflows, connections, and drop points. Workflows can be found by navigating to the workflow section over here. And workflows provide a canvas from which you can drag and drop connectors and tooling provided by the Flowgear platform and construct your integration according to your business rules. We will go more in depth around workflows once we start to explore the specific use case. Connections, which we can navigate to by clicking over here, are spaces with which you can provide credentials that allow you to authenticate and connect to the systems which you would like to integrate with. We can go ahead and click on the new button over here, and we can go ahead and select a particular connector to work with. And connect, choosing any one of the connectors we can see here within the connector section, such as ConnectWise Manage, you'll see there's a space in which you can plug in credentials that are relevant to that specific platform. You then have the option of providing credentials for different profiles, such as test and production, and you will be able to run your workflow or integration within that profile, which will then target that specific environment that you've set up. If you set up your credentials correctly, you can click on the play button over here, which if successful, will give you a green banner telling you that the test succeeded. Finally, we have the drop point section. The idea behind the drop points is that it is our solution to hybrid on-prem and cloud integrations. You can install the drop point agent onto your on-prem servers, which will allow us then to talk to those servers within the scope of what you allow us to do using the whitelisting features. This means that we can talk to your file systems, we can talk to your AD, or we can move data between CRMs and ERPs that are not exposed to the internet with the drop point. These three spaces are the most important aspects related to the integrations themselves within Flowgear. For a deeper dive into the elements that make up the Flowgear console, please see our bite-sized video focusing on navigating the Flowgear console. Next, we're going to take a deeper dive into workflows and nodes. To do this, we're going to navigate to the workflow section, which we have done by clicking on this workflow over here. And from there, we're going to open up a new workflow by clicking on the new button right over here, at which point we're given the option to name the workflow, which we can name it appropriately, and click on the OK button over here, at which point you are then greeted with the Flowgear Design Canvas, the purpose of which is to provide you with the space to drag and drop Flowgear tooling in a specific sequence and order to string it together and then form the basis of an integration from end to end. Now to start dropping the tooling onto the canvas, we're going to click this plus icon over here, which is going to open up a list of our nodes. All of these little blocks are what we consider nodes. And simply put, a node is a function or set of functions that have been encapsulated in a certain way that the most complex aspects of it have been obscured from you and only the parts that you have to interact with are exposed. Now within our nodes, we have distinct categories. And the first category you can see here are the connectors. The connectors are responsible for talking to the systems with which you would like to integrate. And so all of the complexity around authenticating and talking to these platforms is hidden behind the node. And again, only the most relevant aspects of the node are exposed to you. Triggers are nodes that allow you to determine how a workflow should kick off. So it gives you architectural freedom around when a workflow should run and how it should run. In other words, if you would like a workflow to run twice daily or every 15 minutes, or perhaps on receiving a particular email, triggers will facilitate that process. Processes are the nodes that are responsible for actually supplementing, transforming, and enriching the data sets that you need to work with. So when you receive data from system A and needs to be transformed to a different structure so that system B can ingest it, the processes are there to facilitate that functionality as well as implement further business rules that you may have necessary for your integration. And then finally, evaluators are the nodes that are going to have a look at the result of a transaction and allow you to kick off additional supporting logic within that workflow. In other words, should a transaction fail, does somebody need to be emailed? Does someone have to be informed in some way? Does a report have to be built? So, so on and so forth. These four categories encapsulate all the tools that Flowgear provides the integrator, allowing you to build both simple and complex integrations within the scope of a simplified experience. 
In one of our previous videos titled how to utilize the capabilities of our generic REST request connector, we explored the use of one of our generic connectors called the REST request, which ingests an open API definition, previously known as Swagger, to expose an API's capabilities and provide samples to work with. What happens if a web-based API has not exposed a definition that we can consume? This demo will explore the use of one of our most flexible generic connectors, the web request, and how you can connect to any web-based API through its Postman-like interface without the need for a consumable definition. And couple that with one of our branded connectors to push data between a branded connector and a generic connector. The first thing we're going to want to do is open up a new workflow by clicking on the new button over here and giving that workflow an appropriate name. And once we've done that, we are now greeted with the Flogi Design Canvas, the space with which we're going to drag and drop the functionality we need to achieve the integration goal we desire. Now, the first thing we would like to do in terms of the web request is to understand exactly how it functions. And so by opening up the nodes and looking for web request and applying that to the canvas, you can see based on the properties you provided with why I said this was a postman-like experience. Within the scope of the web request, you are expected to provide things like the URL, the headers, and the content type and method manually. These fields can obviously be passed along dynamically based on, on other data coming from the canvas. However, in some cases, some of this will be hard-coded. Now that we see just exactly what we need to do this particular custom integration with the web request, we're going to have a look at the documentation for the actual API that we want to integrate with. And to do that, we're going to navigate to the Swagger UI, Swagger Pet Store site. Now, this particular API or public API actually does have an open API definition that we can consume. But for the purpose of showing you what it would look like without one, we're going to go ahead and use it anyways. And so within any kind of documentation for an API, the most important aspects of it, such as the base URL, the individual endpoints, the kind of authorization usually sit within the scope of the, the documentation. And in this case, this is no different. The first thing we're going to want to do is have a look at what the base URL will be. And if we have a look over there, we can see the base URL is petstore.swagger.io slash v2. We also can have a look at the authorization here by clicking on that button. And we'll see that the authorization is type API key. And we can provide that API key here for authorization. And the endpoints themselves are very simply based on the object that we want to interact with. If we click on one of these examples, such as the post pet, we'll see that the data type itself is JSON. And with that now, we have a pretty clear idea of what's expected from us within the scope of the web request. And so we can navigate back here and relate that to some of the fields we saw here, such as the URL, such as the headers for authorization, content type, method, so on and so forth. Now, the first thing we're going to want to do for the web request is set up a connection. And so if we open up the connection tab and click on the plus icon here, It'll take us straight to the new connection tab that we can then navigate by clicking on the pencil. We'll swap over to the test profile and have a look at some of the fields here. Because the authorization is an API key, we're going to blank out the password. We don't need that. We're going to click on the return HTTP failure responses because we would like errors to come through the response body and not directly from the canvas. And so we can see here that the only thing we really have to provide is the base URL within the connection. And again, after we navigate to the Swagger page, we'll see that the base URL looks like this. So we're going to go ahead and copy that and plug that into the base URL over here. Don't forget to denote that with HTTPS or HTTP, although most web-based APIs will be HTTPS. We can go ahead and give that a save. And we've done all we have to do now for the connection itself. Now, any particular URL you apply above that will be prefixed by that over here. So that being said, we can head back to the documentation and have a look at what type of call we want to make. So in this case, we'll go ahead and do a post pet call. And we can see that the actual URL is simply slash pet after the base URL. And so from here, we're going to go ahead, type in slash pet. And that will be a permanent static URL that we'll use to actually post a pet to this particular API service. As we navigate back to the Swagger UI documentation, we now want to take care of the authorization. And as we click on the authorization tab, we'll see that the way that they authorize is through API key. So we're going to go ahead and specify an API key over here. Copy this and authorize just so they're aware of the authorization we're going to use. Head back to the web request on the canvas, open up the headers, and add an authorization header of type API key with the API key itself and close this off. 
as we saw as well previously on the documentation, the content type itself would be application JSON. We're sending a JSON payload through, and the method in this case will be a post. Now, the only final thing we have to do in this case is provide an actual payload to post into this environment. And so we can head back to Swagger again and copy this entire payload they provide as a sample and bring that across to the post data field here within the web request. Within the scope of a branded connector or a connector that has access to a consumable definition, that sample would have been generated for you and you could have picked it from the actual list of samples. In this case, it has to be manually added because we don't have a definition to work with. So now that we have this full complete web request set up, we can go ahead and test this in isolation just so we know that we are actually interacting with this API in the right way. And so we can click on the options tab here and say, run this node. We can now go ahead and test this web request in isolation. And so we can click over here, run this node. And we will see from the workflow activity logs exactly what's happening. And we can have a look and see if we're getting a response from that API. And we see we have a status code of 200, which is a positive response and a response body to come back with some of the data that we've sent through and a, an ID to say that's the new, <clears throat> unique ID we've created. So through that effort, we've now determined that we can in fact connect to this particular API. We've got the right URL, the right authorization and the right settings and the post data itself looks good. And so the first step of connecting to any custom API or API with no definition is to get some kind of call working and make it as manual as you have to in terms of inputting the post data, so on and so forth. So here we haven't done anything in the scope of an integration really, but we have confirmed that we can talk to this API. Now that we have the basics around how this API should work, uh, we can go ahead and hook this up to a wider process such as getting data from another system and passing it along. And so in this case, we're gonna go ahead and put some of the nodes on the canvas that we would use to do that. And so we'll pick a branded connector, as we said for this example, and we can go ahead and pick Salesforce. And within the scope of Salesforce, we're gonna do exactly what we did with web requests and go and set up a connection. In this case, I will choose a connection that I pre-set up. We can then go ahead and choose a sample in Salesforce. Let's go ahead and refresh this page. From here, we can do something simple like query contact. Head over to the request section. Limit that by one, just so we have some sample data to work with. And we can now also test the Salesforce node in isolation. See that we get a positive response from that with one of the contacts in our system. And now we have both sample data from Salesforce and a piece of sample data that we have to post into the web request. And so we can make use of our flagship transformation tool, the quick map to go ahead and transform that data from structure to structure. By plugging these in and making them aware of each other, the quick map now is cognizance of both data sets coming from Salesforce and the one that's expected to go into the pet store API. And from here we can say change view and now we can see on the left-hand side is the data coming from Salesforce. And on the right-hand side is the structure that has to be adhered to to pass data into the pet store API. Obviously, these two objects, the contacts on the one side and the pets on the other side, don't really make sense. This is clearly not something that you would do in a standard integration um, environment or for any kind of standard production environment. However, we just want to drag some of the data across to show you what that might look like. And to do that, we're simply going to drag, for instance, the first name into the name over here. The type we could drag from here to here, and we can give that. And the rest we can actually leave open or hard code by simply adding the string over here. As you can see, some of these fields are being represented as arrays because it's ambiguous within the scope of the current data sets we have, whether they should be arrays or not. We simply use something called a first function to go ahead and remove those arrays. And now the preview is representing a structure that looks like what the pet store API is expecting. So the purpose of this particular tool is to reduce the effort that one would have to bring to the table around mapping data from point to point significantly. It allows us to transform the data structures from A to B with a simple visual drag and drop, which makes it easy for practically anybody in the organization to go and either maintain, manipulate, or even create these mappings. And beyond simply 
mapping these, these uh, structures from A to B, it also provides you with the ability to further enrich and supplement the data by using functions such as first. There are also additional functions that we provide to do some count, lookup, and practically any function that you could think you would require to enrich the data, such as mathematical functions. And they're very heavily modeled after the Excel environment so that again, anybody in the organization can go ahead and work with these functions. So we're quite happy with what we're seeing here. We can go ahead and close this off and we can run this entire integration now. And what we'll see is that the first step of this particular integration was to grab data from Salesforce. And so we can see that that data coming back from Salesforce here in the form of an XML document, with some very basic information such as the name and, and anything else you can imagine to be on a contact. The quick map then transformed the name and some of the other data into the structure that's expected to go into the pet store API, which we can see a sample of that there now. And then finally, we passed it along to the same web request we configured previously. However, we're dynamically passing along that payload into the post data section. So it is not using the payload that we worked with previously hard coded, but the payload that we got back from the quick map. And that was in fact successful with a unique ID there. And there's the name and status of that pet that we just created. So this particular process should give you confidence around moving data to and from different systems, even though one of those systems may be a branded connector and the other might be an API that is using one of our generic connectors. This particular integration is obviously not production ready. You would want to add additional error handling and potentially other business rules to this whole process. And you can do that through the use of our, our tooling over here within the scope of all of our nodes that can be found on this page. Now that we've shown you how to build a workflow, if at any point you have to go back and see what happened in that workflow, you can navigate to the workflow logs over here. For more detailed information on the topics we explored today, or if you would like to explore more complex aspects of the platform, including architecture and best practices, please join us for our technical certification course hosted on udb.com. Also, go ahead and check out some of our other bite-sized videos for more common use cases and platform features. Also, please go ahead and visit our website where you can register for a free trial and complimentary proof of concept, have a look at our unique pricing model, or explore our list of over 200 pre-built connectors. Thank you very much for joining me for this short demo. Have a lovely day further.